Back in 2008, Biofit designed our first outdoor gym. It was an 800 square meter site on the Adriatic coast, actually as part of a large waterfront marina development or a marina village uh, in a non-tidal inland bay. So it was seawater in front of us, uh, but no actual beaches because there were no waves. In this video, we're gonna talk about our experiences and the lessons learned from that process of designing our first outdoor gym. If you enjoy this content and want to see more, hit subscribe or check out biofit with an f.io to hear more of what we're up to in the natural health and fitness space. So let me describe this site to you. About 800 square meters, pretty big, bordered on three sides by a car park, let's be honest, and that fourth side then was out facing towards a small beach club area that I'd previously designed uh, with waterfront access. It was essentially a concrete slab. So the first issue with an outdoor gym was how to secure the perimeter. I'll come back to the concrete slab point, but you have to have some sense of outside and in, some sense of this is private property or this is somewhere where you need to pay for access. It's a business after all. So the fencing uh, was a huge piece of work because by the time you've created uh, some form of protection around all of that perimeter. It was quite a big slice of the overall budget. So for sure, I would have started with that and with, as it turns out, the price of sand. In the end, we used a series of four by fours, so wooden planks, we varnished them. We're in a marina, so we had lots of access to the right type of wood, the right type of varnish, and generally things that will protect natural materials from the weather, the elements, water, sea, etc. So we did our best in that sense, uh, but it was a challenge, both the location uh, and the size of the space. So we ended up with these slotted um, planks of wood. Uh, we created a trough, so we had to go into the concrete, create a trough all the way around, and then the, the slats of wood went into the trough, and then we put the concrete or added an extra layer back on top to secure them. So that meant they were, it was visible through the, the slats of wood, um, but there was enough, there was no way to get through them, so we at least had a secure perimeter fence. Why was that important? Because it meant light could enter clearly, not just from above, but from all the sides. People arriving in this infamous car park could also see inside, but those working out or training inside had some sense of privacy. So there was a real challenge between, well, do we put up a wire fence? Do we put up, use a more natural material? Do we create something that blocks the light out or blocks rather views from outside and, and from in out? Or are we better off creating a soft uh, barrier that doesn't do the same effect. And in the end, we went for something slightly softer. So we really had two options in terms of the gym flooring. We could either lay a serious amount of sand on top of the existing concrete slab, or more expensive option, we could lay some turf, which meant creating a whole system uh, of sort of irrigation and what have you on top. Even if we eventually could have used artificial turf, um, the final solution, but given the location in a marina, uh, near the water was to go with sand. Now it turns out there are various different types of sand. Who knew? Uh, there's <laughs> actually there's real sand uh, and then there are things like limestone dust uh, and various other forms. So you've really got quite a few options in terms of how high end you go or how much money you save. Now when you are covering 800 square meters of space it's huge especially when you need to create something that um, feels relatively soft and giving underfoot. So again, quantities were a real challenge and finding enough of a particular type from a single supplier was also a challenge in that particular place. Now there may be in other parts of the world, I'm guessing Dubai, uh, where sand is, is more readily available, uh, but here on the Adriatic coast it was, it was a bit of a challenge. So our first attempt, looking back, uh, gave us quite a dark sand finish and although it was fine uh, and, or as in granular, small uh, grains, it uh, stuck to the feet a lot and it gave us a very dark finish that, that the owner just wasn't happy with. So while we used that as our baseline, we then put another layer on top of more yellowish or white yellow sand on top to create this sort of genuine beach look. It was then hard packed, uh, so that just ended up being a more sensible approach in terms of having people running around on top of it. Uh, and it became more practical as well. A lot of rain in the winter, so we had to consider that. So we ended up with something 
white, yellow, more hard packed than your sort of typical Atlantic soft sand beach, uh, but it was fine. It's, it became a, a practical solution in the end. I then created um, six stations for uh, outdoor speakers uh, and one amplifier that ran out of the uh, beach club just next door. So we then had a fence, we had our flooring, and we had some sound, so we were in business. We did need to consider, it's an open air facility, we did need to consider our neighbors, namely the yachts in the marina. They did not particularly want to hear our music after a certain hour, so we had to create a music policy. We were just using mostly deep house music anyway, so nothing too crazy, but it started about nine in the morning and we, we turned it off at about seven in the evenings. We didn't have any floodlights. Floodlights would be another major expense, I think. Uh, we didn't go for that route con considering that most people probably want to work out as it turned out in the early evening. So if you're in a high um, temperature destination as we were on the Adriatic coast, we had to close things off by about seven. It would have been great to stay open until sort of nine or 10 with the music playing. We wouldn't have needed floodlights, uh, but it was an operational issue um, that meant that the beach club next door closed at seven, so we also had to close at seven. So if you're in an outdoor gym and you have warmth in the summer, most people are gonna wanna train uh, not in the middle of the day, uh, they'll either be early in the morning or in the evening. So you need those extended opening hours. Now that has an implication on your operations. It might mean a double shift if you have someone working in the mornings, then someone working in the evenings or in the afternoons and evenings. So you have to get that right. Closing in the middle of the day is an option. Um, you just need to be very clear with your customers up front on how that works and exactly what time you open and close. For the gym equipment, we supplied some of our own designs uh, made by well, basically my, me and my family, uh, my uncle who's a, who works with wood. Um, so as a carpenter, we were able, he was able to create an A-frame uh, pull-up bar for us. We had a lifting log, we had some push-up bars. We threw all those in, gave them triple layer varnishes and, uh, and used that as our sort of starting point for the outdoor natural fitness equipment. We also contacted a local carpenter slash um, boat maker who was able to work to a couple of my designs for some outdoor parallel bars, so uh, about sort of chest high parallels. He also made us some storage, a storage unit with a sort of protective case for all of our sandbags and kettlebells, um, the clubs and skipping ropes and other things like that that needed a home. Obviously there's no storage, no shelving, and you need some of that, otherwise everything just gets left out on the floor, and that creates additional maintenance and health and safety problems. We also had one existing central, actually electricity hut in the middle of the gym. Now we either had to turn that into a feature or try and hide it somehow. So uh, I covered it in bamboo, uh, bamboo sticks all the way around and on top, and then created some hooks at top and bottom for TRX and gymnastic rings and battle ropes. So it then became this sort of central rig almost where we can get eight people training at any one time and actually turned into a real feature. So we were pleased with that. So lesson there is sometimes you have to work with what you've got. It's not always perfect, but if you can convert something into uh, a practical feature, uh, then actually people don't seem to mind that there's a, effectively an electricity hut in the middle of the, the outdoor gym. By the end, it looked kind of cool. It looks like a sort of yeah, a tropical hut. And once you hang everything off it, it fitted in perfectly. As we had so much space, we also commissioned three huge jump boxes from the same uh, local carpenter. Again, had to choose the right wood. We wanted to fill that space a bit more, uh, so having things that people could jump onto or climb over were really practical and there was no shortage of room to place them all in. So again, we had a few things that were interrupting the ground, um, a few sort of um, manhole covers and things. We're like, right, well, what can we do with those? The sand might move over time, so let's cover them completely with these jump boxes and leave the jump boxes there. So sometimes, again, the flooring is not gonna be perfect depending on what you inherit. You gotta work with it and occasionally use some creative solutions to cover up uh, the less sightly elements of the existing site. I mentioned the kettlebell, so I, I basically bought a full set of competition kettlebells and then got the local, um, yeah, these guys working in the the chandlery to paint them with boat paint. So boat paint is, as you would imagine, for the, the hull of a boat. 
um, super resistant to water and the elements. So it's literally like a coat of plastic, um, except it's not plastic. And we did those in the white and blue of the local um, beach, beach club or, or yacht club rather. So they were, if you like, branded and completely protected from the elements. And they've been one of the most striking visual pieces of equipment that we added in and became this sort of yeah, great feature visually, uh, as well as a highly practical set of kettlebells that have lasted really, really well. So that was a good choice, a good decision. It added to the cost of the kettlebell set by about 30%, but a worthwhile investment. One element that really suffered in that first summer of heat were some 5kg uh, rubber weight plates for uh, the lifting lock. So while we didn't want to have any barbells out there because the metal would just take up too, too much heat. So the only way to use metal barbells would be to have them in some shaded structure. And I'll come back to that because we did create a shade structure in the end uh, in response to customer requests. But we had a lifting log with space to add some uh, of these, these weight plates. But the 5kg ones that were thin, they basically just got fried in the first summer. Whereas the 10kg and 20kg ones survived much better. So lesson learned, don't go for the thin 5kgs or buy better quality 5kg plates or just go for the, the 10 to 20k ones. If they're going to be left out, and they will unless you have someone there on site tidying things up all day, every day, and we just didn't have that kind of operational support. So unfortunately the gym users would just leave the plates out in the sun. You can't blame them for that. They don't want to put things back every, every time in the, in the neat shelves. So you have to plan for that. And I would have bought higher quality plates next time I am buying higher quality weight plates for sure. So I mentioned shade. In the end, it turned out that there was just too much heat in the summer, which was the high season for the marina village. So, and we didn't offer any shade, so therefore we were losing a lot of potential clients who wanted to work out at different times of day when it was just too hot and there was too much direct sun. So we created a frame structure and then hung some, um, it was huge sheets of almost this sort of like camouflage netting. We bought it in sand color and it just creates this dappled light effect, allowing the light to come through, but breaking it up by about two thirds and reducing the heat intensity considerably. So that was a great solution in the end. We created about 36 square meters of space. It was really easy to do, didn't cost that much and solved the problem completely. So there we go, just a few of the lessons learned from our first outdoor gym. The next one will be bigger, better, better. Uh, and there are always things that can be improved. You're not expected always to get it 100% right as you start. The key is to continue to uh, go back Go back over your work, be humble enough to recognize some things that perhaps didn't work and just improve each time until you get it 100% right. And that's all we can ever do. So that's it for now. We'll see you on the channel soon.